Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Doug nursed a drink and stared at the lazy Texas sunset. Man, I'm gonna miss this. I ain't gonna miss the summer heat, but there's something about standing in your backyard wearing only shorts and a t-shirt in November that I could have gotten used to. Oh, and the smell of Texas barbecue. Damn, my mouth is already watering. Turning, I glanced back on the family cookout that was in progress behind me. The get-together was in my honor, celebrating my recent promotion as shop foreman. It was labeled an adult party, and the half-dozen company employees and their spouses were there without any children. I was thankful for that because I had every intention of turning this into my farewell party. When I got the chance, I went out to my truck. I picked up what I figured I'd need for a visual aid. I suspected they'd ask me to give some kind of speech, and I wanted to make it memorable. I stuck my Glock 9mm into the back of my jeans and made sure it wasn't noticeable under my dinner jacket. Making my way back through the guests, I saw my boss coming towards me. Tommy Peterson was a big, fat guy with a smile that could light up half of Dallas. Even in his fifties, the man had a presence about him that both demanded respect and put you at ease. Beside him walked Martha, his wife, my problem. All right, maybe she ain't the problem. Maybe she's just the moron who keeps opening the damn door and letting the real problem in. It don't really matter either way. It gets taken care of today. Martha Peterson was more than a little on the heavy side, but was still decent looking, even in her fifties. She had that kind of personality that drew people to her and made her mama or grandma to just about everyone. Problem was she believed the old wives' tale, mama knows best. Since I'd moved here 11 months ago, she'd made it her mission in life to set me up with the perfect woman. It didn't matter what I did or what I said. She couldn't get it through her thick head I just wasn't interested in dating. I'm still trying to get over my first marriage. Maybe if I would have yelled or thrown some kind of fit she would have gotten the hint. But that just ain't me. I tend to be quiet, polite, and private. I guess if I'd been more of an ass, well that's gonna change. There they sat, Martha and several of the other wives, all just beaming like cats that had caught a mouse. They'd found their perfect girl for me, and there she was sitting with them. She was beautiful barely five feet but with a good figure, long blonde hair, and a very pretty face. Of course she always looked great because she worked in a beauty salon. I had to give them credit, I thought she was the perfect girl for me too. Till about two years ago. Unfortunately, the perfect girl they'd been pushing on me the past couple months was my ex-wife, Teresa. The fact they knew that is what really burned my ass. I hadn't told them the real story behind my divorce because it wasn't any of their damn business. I told them I didn't want to date her, or talk to her, or even be in the same state as her. Now, there she sat, surrounded by a bunch of women who were extremely pleased with themselves at finally getting my ex-wife and me face to face. Teresa probably hadn't told them much about our how our marriage ended because she tended to leave out little things when she didn't want to face something. She had a way about her that charmed almost everyone she met. She told them she'd made a mistake and that I refused to talk to her and forgive her. She played the broken and sorry wife role perfectly. That and her, I pray for the chance to show Doug how much I really love him. Routine had Martha and her hen party eating out of her hand. Tommy stood up, addressed the group, and finally introduced me. Showtime. I'd like to thank y'all for coming out tonight. I know this was supposed to be a celebration, and I guess it is in a way. Tommy offered me the job as shop foreman, and I want to thank him for that. But sir, I'm going to have to turn it down because as of today, I quit. Sorry to spring this on you, and I'll understand if you don't want to give me a good reference, but I'm going to be gone tomorrow no matter what happens. I watched the startled faces as Tommy opened his mouth to say something. Doug, this is a party in my home, he said sternly. No disrespect to you, sir. You've been more than fair with me and I owe you an explanation, but there are others here, I said coldly, that I sure as hell don't owe anything. Doug? Martha said. Martha, I think you and the rest of your little coven have done more than enough to me. I'd made it very clear I didn't want to date anyone, and I sure as hell made it clear I didn't want to be anywhere near my ex-wife. Apparently, what I want ain't important. So... I'm either going to speak now or I leave for good. Your choice, either one sounds pretty good to me right now. The group was silent except for the sound of Teresa crying. All right, then I'll tell you a little story. 
Teresa looked up at me and slowly shook her head, her eyes begging me to not go on. You see, about two years ago I left my little hometown in Georgia for the first time in my life. I left behind a destroyed marriage and a family who'd turned their backs on me. I came here 11 months ago trying to start a new life, but it seems I can't get away from my past. It just keeps finding me, with the help of others. I glared at Martha until she looked away. I married my high school sweetheart five years ago. She was everything I ever wanted or dreamed of. We got married after she graduated, and for three years, I thought we had the perfect marriage. She worked in a beauty salon and I worked in one of my family's garages. My dad owns several garages across northern Georgia, so that's where I learned to be a mechanic. But just like the Garden of Eden had a serpent, so did my marriage. Unfortunately, my serpent turned out to be my kid brother, Billy. Billy is three years younger than me, but he's always been the center of attention in my family. He's supposedly a recovering drug addict, and has been since he was 15 and dropped out of school. All my life, my parents have a looked out for him, sacrificed themselves, and me, for whatever was best for Billy. I heard Doug, we have to help him. He's sick more times than I can count. So, three years ago, when I heard he'd been evicted from his latest dump, I wasn't surprised. My family, including my wife, wanted him to stay with us until he could get admitted into another rehab. My response wasn't no, but hell no. Both my wife and my parents were shocked and appalled. I could be so cold and turn my back on my brother. In my mind, I didn't turn my back on him, I just wasn't enabling him. Over the next few weeks, they made my life a living hell, pressuring me until I agreed to let Billy come and stay. And my reward for trying to be a good big brother? I glared at my ex-wife, trying to calm myself. I'm not sure what line my piece of shit brother fed to my wife to get her to have sex with him, but it worked. Of course, neither one ever bothered to let me know about it. Two months later, I got the great news, honey, I am pregnant. Like a dumbass, I was thrilled since we've been trying to have a kid for the past year. Imagine my surprise, a few months later, when the doctor told us there was something wrong with the baby. That the baby had a small heart defect that was common with women who used cocaine. My wife of course denied ever using drugs. Then the doctor said something that turned my world into a nightmare. He said there were studies that said drug abuse didn't have to be from the mother. Early studies showed sperm from a drug addict could cause birth defects. I started getting pissed. He asked me if I'd been doing drugs. When I told him I hadn't, he said birth defects were still a mystery and there must be another reason. My wife, the one who I trusted more than anyone in this world, told me I was the child's father. But things weren't adding up right. When the baby was born, they did the surgery. It was considered a total success. But I'm not a complete fool so I had a DNA test run. When the results came back it was final. I was an uncle. I lost it. I threw all of my cheating wife's things out of the house, grabbed my Glock, and went looking for that shit. I once called a brother. I looked everywhere but couldn't find him. My parents had stashed him in some out-of-state rehab. So how did they know? Well, there's another little kick in the balls. Seems my brother waited a whole week before he told them about sharing his older brother's reason to live. Then the four of them sat on their asses, hoping I would never find out their little secret. I filed for divorce the next day. As soon as my 304 of a wife got served, the non-stop load of bullshit started from her and my parents. I wouldn't talk to the cheating 304 for weeks. I couldn't stand to look at her or even hear her voice. I was in shock. All my dreams were trashed. I'd been screwed over and lied to by the ones who claimed they loved me. After a week of nonstop shit from my parents, I agreed to talk to her. I heard all her excuses. He was depressed and said he'd nothing to live for. She felt sorry for him. She was only trying to comfort him and it went too far. The weed he was smoking clouded her mind. It was only that one night. It was just a mercy sex and didn't mean anything. Seems their first attempt was so bad he started talking suicide. The second time, she restored his will to live. My ex-wife, trying to earn sainthood one tool at a time, makes one wonder if she's been visiting the homeless shelters and spreading her joy. I spit the bile that was building in my mouth. Teresa sat there and quietly cried. Both Teresa and my parents were on me like flies on shit, but they weren't alone. They recruited others to talk to me. 
My favorite was when the pastor of the church my family has attended for generations paid me a visit. My family was big in giving to the church and had funded a bunch of their building projects. He went on and on about forgiveness. After a bit I got tired of it and agreed to forgive, but with two conditions. The first was that he would preach a sermon Sunday on coveting your brother's wife. The second was that the following Sunday I would get to stand before the entire congregation and give my testimony before I publicly forgave them. I smiled as I remembered his reaction. I never heard from him again. Of course my parents just kept going, I snarled. I heard all their expected bullshit. I needed to be a bigger man than this. Teresa had made a mistake, but her heart was good. My wife and baby needed me, and a real man wouldn't abandon them. They raised me better than this. They went on and on. My dad finally told me how disappointed he was in me for not forgiving Teresa and Billy. I told them both how disappointed I was in them as parents. After that, I gave them both barrels and told exactly what I thought of them. It was very ugly. Finally, when they asked me if I'd read my brother's apology letter and that I shouldn't blame Billy because he was sick, I lost it again. I told them I'd wiped my bum with his letter. I also told them to never mention my brother's name to me ever again. They didn't believe me, so I decided to convince them. I stared at my audience making sure I had their complete attention. Reaching behind me, I pulled out my Glock. There were several gasps and more than a few cuss words. I thanked God I was at Tommy and Martha's house. Usually pulling a gun in Texas would get your bum shot. But, I knew Martha had banned any guns from being brought into her home, so I would be the only one carrying. The arsenal my co-workers usually carried would have been left in their trucks or other vehicles. I lowered my voice to a menacing growl and continued. I see you had the same reaction as my parents. I remember the words I spoke to them that day. You mentioned that moron's name to me one more time, and I will hunt the son of a witch down and put a bullet in his head. I swear to God, you will be burying your favorite son within the week. I paused to watch the color drain out of several people's faces. I'd made my point. Apparently, my parents believe me since they haven't spoken to me since that day. Too bad I can't say the same for my ex-wife. I figured I might actually hurt someone if I stayed there any longer, so I moved across the state line to Alabama to wait out my divorce. I left Teresa and the kid everything but a few dollars I needed to get started again. Guess I should be grateful it took her six months to find me. I'd heard she had some kind of breakdown and had to be hospitalized. Seems she tried to kill herself. She failed. It was kinda like her trying to stay faithful to her husband. Close but no cigar. I stared at Teresa as she buried her face in her hands. Her shoulders heaved as she sobbed. I'd like to tell you I felt sorry for her but I didn't. She'd made me what I am now by tearing out my heart. All that was left was the pain from my past and a rage I have to fight to control every day. Over the past two years I'd found I couldn't move on. The fact Teresa kept stalking me didn't help. She'd always said we were soulmates, destined to be together throughout time. I thought it was kinda silly, like she'd read it somewhere and just liked the sound of it. I have my doubts now. I've never felt so alone. Like a part of me is missing. I find myself looking next to me wanting to ask her what she thinks. At times I've even reached out for her hand, but it's never there. I can feel my heart growing colder and the anger growing each time it happens. Before this, she'd always been there for me. I remembered my graduation. My dad wasn't there because Billy had gotten in trouble again. Dad had gone down to the police station to pick him up and to talk with a magistrate. My mom was so worried. She was a basket case so I told her to just go and join dad. So my graduation party included my friends and some family members, but none of my immediate family. I tried to hide my disappointment, but Teresa saw through it right away. She'd made sure I felt loved that night several times. It really had been my special night. I woke up in the middle of the night after my party, lying in my bed with her naked body snuggled beside me. I noticed my parents standing in my doorway staring at us. Slowly I got up, put my boxers on and walked over to my bedroom door. My dad wanted to say something about Teresa being there, but he thought better of it. My mom had tears in her eyes. They both whispered their apologies to me for missing my party. I lied and told them it wasn't a big deal. I remember telling them I'd be moving out soon and I'd be moving in with my cousin until Teresa and I could get married. Then I shut the door in their faces. 
My attention was drawn back to my audience when a couple started to stand up. I cleared my throat and shook my head. They quickly sat back down. Carefully, I put my Glock down beside me and you could hear the sighs of relief. I looked at them and continued my story. When she finally found me, she moved into the same trailer park I was living in. After I got a restraining order against her and still filed about a dozen more complaints, I knew I needed to move again. The divorce had finally come through, so I packed up and moved here to Texas. She didn't mention the little fact of a restraining order to you when she gave you her sob story about our marriage, did she Martha? Martha was now starting to cry as she shook her head. Didn't think so. She's pretty good at leaving out little important details. When I got to Texas, I was lucky to find someone like Tommy, who helped me start over again. He gave me the chance to prove myself and didn't pry into my past very much. I'd made it clear I didn't want to talk about my past, and after making sure I wasn't running from the law, he was okay with that. Again, too bad his wife wouldn't listen. I hadn't told anyone where I was moving, not even the couple of friends I still had in Georgia. So, imagine my surprise when three months ago my ex-wife moved into town. An even bigger joy was when my boss wife decided to try to get me and my cheating ex-wife back together again. Martha started to speak, but I interrupted her. You had your chance, but you sure as hell never listened. Now it's my turn. I spewed with enough rage to shut her up. I've made it clear a shitload of times over the last year I didn't want to date and didn't want to discuss or have to explain my past. I sure as hell didn't want to get back with my wife. But apparently, what I want doesn't mean shit. Martha sobbed. Doug, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I cut her off right there. Didn't know? I spat. Since when do you have to know before you'll respect someone else's privacy? Who the hell do you think you are that someone has to explain it to you before you'll give him the common courtesy of staying the hell out of his life? I could tell my words had hit their mark. It was time to wrap up this sad little show. So Martha, I want to thank you and these other busybodies for making my last two months a living hell. I would wish y'all well, but that would be a bold-faced lie. Personally, I hope y'all turn on each other and make each other's lives miserable. I looked down and saw Teresa's tear-streaked face. Please, baby, please, she begged. Please give me another chance. I told you to get the hell away from me, Teresa. Go home to your kid. I can't unless I bring his daddy back with me. You want to find the kid's father? Go look in some rehab or in some gutter. If you were meaning me, then it ain't ever gonna happen. If you haven't been following our little story, I sure as hell ain't the kid's father. I picked up my Glock, put it back in my belt, and turned to walk through the crowd. They parted faster than a trailer tramp's legs at a NASCAR party. I heard several apologies, and a few even looked me in the eye. As I reached the driveway, I heard Teresa scream behind me. Doug, wait. Please don't go. I can't live without you, Doug. She screamed as she fell to ground weeping. You have to come home. You just have to. I turned around and looked at her. Listen, witch. I don't give a shit if you take a razor to your wrists or not. Just stay the hell away from me. I saw everyone staring at me. Seems I still can't get anyone to listen to me. I snarled and walked to my truck. Now let's listen the story from Teresa's perspective. The doctors tell me recording my thoughts is good therapy and this will help me discover myself. Personally, I think they're full of shit. They don't seem to understand that I've lost my Doug. He's my rock, my soul mate, my lover, my best friend, and until recently my husband. I lost him because of one stupid mistake. A mistake he can't forgive me for. To understand us, you need to know our past. Doug and I started dating in high school. He was a sophomore and I was just a freshman. I knew I loved him from the moment we first kissed. We went all through high school together, and I knew we would end up getting married. Three months after I graduated, we had our wedding. I'm sure my parents were thrilled. First, they were glad I was out of their house and second, because we didn't have to get married. As good little Southern Baptists, I think they were afraid I was going to get knocked up. My parents and I were always arguing. They loved Doug but didn't like my lifestyle. The sex and drinking was too much for them. Of course they knew I'd never do that with anyone but Doug. He was all I'd ever wanted. He's always been who I thought was my soul mate. Even when I messed up, it had nothing to do with my love for him. Although he doesn't see it that way, all he sees is the cheating. He doesn't understand that when I see how bad he hurts, 
I die too. Doug has always been my rock. Whenever I would lose control, he was always there, until now. Most people think he's shy and quiet, but I know better. What he really is, is a volcano. He's always calm on the outside, but inside it can just build and build until he explodes. I've seen it happen several times, but rarely ever in public. One time it happened in front of a bunch of our classmates. We'd gone to a keg party and had been drinking when this jerk, Jerry Whitmore, grabbed my bum. I turned around and slapped him. Then the drunk a hole grabbed me and tried to feel me up. He must have had a death wish to do that in front of Doug. Even though Doug ain't the biggest guy, he's strong and in real good shape. Jerry didn't even get a punch in before Doug had him on the ground, sitting on him and pounding his face. It took three guys to pull Doug off him, and when they did there was blood everywhere. Doug messed him up pretty bad and there was talk of charging Doug. But, then I threatened to file sexual assault charges against Jerry and everything was dropped. Needless to say, I never had a problem with any other guy after that. Like I said earlier, Doug and I got married right after I graduated. It was the happiest time that I can remember. He was already working as a mechanic in one of his father's garages, and I went to beauty school. Soon, we had enough money saved to buy our first house. It wasn't much, just a little two-bedroom, matchbox house, but it was ours. The first two years were tight since we didn't have much money. But we had each other, and it was more than enough. I was so happy it seemed I was living in some fairy tale. Doug and I didn't have a perfect marriage, but it sure seemed that way sometimes. We'd argue, but then I'd pout or cry, and he would give in most of the time. I didn't do that very often. I didn't want to take advantage of my Doug. Our love was like a protective wall around us, keeping us safe from the outside world. I guess that's why I never saw the danger until it was too late. When Billy was evicted from his trailer, our problems started. He had no place to stay since, at the time, he was arguing with his and Doug's parents. Even though they didn't want him staying with them again so soon after the last time, they didn't want him on the street either. They asked us if he could stay with us for a few weeks until they could get him into another rehab center. I said okay, but Doug said no. I knew Doug had lots of issues with his family, most of them he had a right to be pissed about. Doug's parents, Tom and Paula, are pretty decent folk. They were just unlucky enough to have a son that was a mess. That mess tore their family apart, and then killed mine as well. Billy was always the loud one. The one who'd do almost anything on a dare. While Doug, on the other hand, was that quiet force always standing in the background but you always knew was there. Together they were a team. That lasted until Doug went to high school. In high school, Doug started hanging around his friends and football teammates more. Billy reacted by being even more an attention hound. Soon, it was obvious Billy was going to try to be a bad boy or some kind of rebel. It ain't a surprise Billy started hanging around the druggies. Doug and I were dating by then, and I knew it tore Doug up watching Billy fall down that hole. Billy was a full-fledged addict by the time he was a freshman. He'd already torn the family up pretty good by then. He dropped out the same year Doug graduated. Doug's parents tried everything, but didn't know what to do with Billy. They tried sweet-talking, bribing, threatening, and finally, they tried some tough love. Billy simply used it as an excuse to drop out of school. After that, Tom and Paula ended up caving into him on just about everything. While I understood their problem, it then became all about Billy. They did everything for him and basically left Doug to fend for himself most of the time. I know that really hurt Doug. Billy was just hellbent on destroying his life. It was too bad because he could have been something special. My Doug's a good-looking guy, but everyone agrees Billy would have been better-looking when he grew up. Unfortunately, with the drug addiction, no one will ever know. Doug tried a bunch of times to reach out to Billy. Billy's response was to steal from his brother and their parents then buy more drugs. When Billy turned 18, Doug stopped trying. We'd been married about two and a half years when Billy got evicted. I'll admit Tom, Paula, and I were pretty relentless on trying to get Doug to change his mind. I think Tom and Paula felt they were out of options, and I think they needed to ease their guilt. They didn't want Billy to come back to live with them again. They had just thrown him out several months earlier after he'd stolen a bunch of money from them. I wanted Doug to change his mind because you can't just turn your back on family also. It was getting close to Christmas, and it would have been a horrible holiday with Billy living on the street. It was just a few days after Christmas, when I let my fairy tale marriage come crashing down. 
Doug had called and told me he was trying to fix the transmission for a middle-aged, single mother of three there in town. It was her only car, so he and one of the other guys were gonna work through the night to get it fixed for her. Damn, I love him. I got home late from the beauty salon that night. When I walked into the house I almost gagged. The smoke from Billy's weed was like a fog. I walked over and pounded on the bedroom door but he didn't answer me. Pissed off, I opened up some windows and then went to take a shower. After my shower, I got ready for bed. The smell of smoke still reeked, but I needed to shut the windows because it was cold outside. After shutting the windows, I went and banged on Billy's door again. This time he answered. The way he looked scared me. His eyes were bright red and I couldn't tell if it was from the smoke or if he'd been crying. He had such a look of despair and gloom I really started worrying about him. He turned around, walked back over by the bed, and sat on the floor next to his bong. I stepped in and immediately felt a rush from the smoke. I'd smoked pot on occasion so I was familiar with what it was doing to me. I went and got a fan and brought it back into the room. I opened a window and set the fan to start blowing the smoke out. Billy just sat there mumbling. When I was done, I sat down next to him. Even though that night is fuzzy, I'm sure I remember the way things happened. I remember I started in on him. Damn it, Billy. I said, if Doug smells this when he gets home, he'll kick your bum out. Maybe that would be for the best, he mumbled. When I looked at him, I saw such sadness. It was like he'd given up. Hell, it don't matter anyway, he sighed, while tilting his head back and looking at the ceiling. I am dying anyway. I was shocked. It took me a few seconds to respond. Oh shit, Billy, do you got AIDS? He snorted and shook his head. Nah, I hate needles, but it's the other way of getting it that's proof I am dying. He looked at me and must have seen my confusion. With a deep sad sigh, he answered my unspoken question. I, I, a uh, shit, he started. Even with some of the skanks I hang around, I couldn't catch AIDS that way, even if I tried. He sat there watching me as it finally dawned on me what he meant. When it did, I couldn't believe it. I mean, hell, he just turned 19. Did, did you like, go to a doctor? Yeah, he nodded. He said it was the drugs. Hell, I checked out clean for STDs and AIDS, but it don't make a whole lot of difference now, does it? I can't usually get it up and when I do, I can't keep it hard for very long. I can barely scrape enough money together to feed my habit, so buying some little blue pills ain't likely. Hell, if I can't be much of a man, I might as well end it. So getting thrown out by my lucky big brother really doesn't mean shit. We sat quietly for a few minutes. I'm ashamed that I began to think of ways to help, and most of them I knew Doug wouldn't approve of. Doug's not really lucky, he just works hard, I said. That ain't what I was talking about, he mumbled. Billy looked at me with tears in his eyes. Then what? I asked softly. I was talking about you, he whispered. I know I blushed. I turned my head so he couldn't see it. Doug's always been lucky because of you. You give him the strength to do what he needs to do. If it wasn't for you, he'd be just as big of a screw-up as I am. So yeah, he's lucky. If I'd found someone like you, things would have been different. He buried his head in his hands and sighed. I know he was stroking my ego. At least I do now. Then, well things are hazy. I think it was the smoke, since it was still pretty heavy in the room. If I could do it all over, I would have got up and left right there, but I didn't. What I did was open the door to the end of my marriage. I looked over at him and I saw a broken kid, someone who didn't have a reason to live. My heart broke as I saw his pain. I reached over and put my arms around him and hugged him. He put his head on my shoulder and I gently stroked his hair. After a few minutes, he reached up and gently touched my cheek, and then he kissed me, softly. Billy, I whispered. You shouldn't. Please, Teresa, he begged softly. I've never kissed a good woman before. Please. I know I should have stopped it right there, but I froze. I didn't kiss him back, but I didn't stop him either. He kissed me again and reached around me and pulled me tight. I didn't respond. I guess he thought my lack of response was a green light. His kisses grew in passion while his hands caressed me underneath my t-shirt. When one hand slipped down between my legs, I flinched. Billy, I whispered. Please, Teresa, I need a reason to live. Was that a line? Of course it was. But I actually believed he was on the edge of despair. Whether I was stoned or just stunned by the moment, 
I didn't get up, I didn't scream, I didn't kick, or do the things I should have if I wanted to fight for my marriage. Instead, I just sat there confused, torn on what I should do. After he stroked me for a minute, he slowly pushed me back onto the floor. I'm not sure when he undid his jeans and mine, but I felt him push into me. I wasn't completely ready for him, he slid into me fully as my body slowly responded. As he began pumping into me, I almost laughed. With me just lying there, I thought of the image of a dog dry humping someone's leg. I could feel him having trouble maintaining an erection. Soon it was obvious he wasn't gonna be able to finish the job. He sat back and I remember that I'd never seen a face before in so much torment. He actually began to cry. It was then I made my decision. I remember thinking that the damage had already been done. I'd allowed Billy to cross a line that Doug would never forgive. Even though I hadn't made love to Billy, I hadn't stopped him from having sex with me either. Since I was already lost, I knew some good had to come out of this. I reached out and gently touched Billy. Come here, I said softly. I took his hand as we stood up and pushed him onto the bed. I stripped off my panties and t-shirt and removed the rest of his clothes. He just lay on his back, staring at me quietly. I got his attention when I began to revive him with B-Job, and soon he was moaning his pleasure. I crawled up on the bed and allowed him to touch and caress me as I continued to stroke him. Soon, I had him strong enough for me to take him. I straddled him like a horse and guided him into me. Slowly, I began to grind myself into him creating a rhythm. It wasn't making love. There were no tender words or touches. Those were saved for my husband. This was just sex. Doug had always told me, the more excited I got when we made love, the better it was for him. He said when I lost myself in our passion, it made him more excited and the more excited he was, the harder he got. With a final conviction, I threw myself into what I was doing. I used every trick I'd learned from having sex with Doug those past five years. Everything I knew that turned my husband on, I tried on Billy. I even used the thought of having sex with someone I shouldn't, just to get me more excited. As I ground myself into him, I felt his response immediately. He became hard as a rock as he drove himself up into me. I realized then that Billy was longer than my Doug. Doug had the ability to drive me to an orgasm within minutes. He knew what I liked, what I wanted, and what I needed. He had something no other man will ever have, my love. I began to whimper and say some of the things I said to Doug when we had sex. Then with a surprise, Billy exploded inside me. His action pushed me over the edge and I screamed out my release. As I lay on top of him panting, I could hear him breathlessly whispering, Thank you, thank you, oh God thank you. I lay there, knowing I accomplished something. I'd given hope to someone who didn't have any. Do you know how that feels? It feels incredible. I rolled off Billy and stood up. It was at that point I came back to reality. Then the magnitude of my cheating hit me square in the face. I quickly grabbed my clothes and started for the bedroom door. Billy called out to me. Teresa? I turned and stared at him as the tears began to fill my eyes. Never again, Billy, I said softly. This will never happen again and Doug can't ever know. You understand me? He can't know. Ever. Billy nodded and lay back on the bed. He covered his face with his arms and I think I heard him begin to cry. I went and took another shower. I tried to scrub myself clean on the outside. On the inside, I tried to justify my actions, but I couldn't. I hadn't set out to cheat on Doug, but that's the way he'd see it. The fact it was with his brother would kill him. I cried myself to sleep that night. I knew I'd changed us forever. The next morning, Doug was furious. The smell of pot was still noticeable. He about threw Billy out right then and there. Why he didn't, I'm not really sure. I was a mess, still trying to get my emotions under control so Doug wouldn't think something was wrong. That night, I made love to my Doug like there would be no tomorrow. In a way, I was scared there might not be. When he asked, I told him I'd had a nightmare that he'd left me. He was so kind and gentle with me that night I lost count of the orgasms. My Doug was mine and I was his again. I would never again be so stupid. Over the next few weeks, I noticed Billy watching me, but he never tried to talk to me alone. He moved out three weeks later. Two weeks after he'd moved out, I discovered I was pregnant. Doug and I were thrilled. I honestly never believed the child wasn't Doug's. I mean, 
We'd had a very active sex life since we got married and probably did the nasty several times each week. So, I figured we'd done it at least 25 times since I'd been with Billy. Not until Billy asked me if he might be the father did I start getting concerned. I learned much to my anger and embarrassment that Billy had already confessed to Tom and Paula what had happened. They weren't happy, but they didn't throw me to the wolves either. After talking with them, we decided to let our secret die and pray Doug would never find out. I was sick. I'd never kept anything from Doug before, but I knew this would destroy him. Every night I prayed the child was his and he'd never find out. The day that doctor said there was a problem with the baby, I knew my prayers weren't answered. He said it could be fixed with surgery. But, depending on how bad it was, they might have to do surgery right after it was born. When he said that kind of birth defect had been linked to coke abuse, my heart stopped beating. He asked me if I did drugs, and I told him absolutely not. Then, he asked Doug the same thing, and said they had studies showing if the father was a drug user it could cause defects too. I almost died right there. Doug started to come unglued until the doctor told him that when it came to birth defects, they didn't know anything for sure. But I knew right then the seed of doubt had been planted. Over the next few months, I tried to assure Doug that it was his without letting him know there was a possibility it wasn't. He never came right out and asked. I knew I was holding on to just a glimmer of hope the baby really was Doug's. But there weren't any other options. After the baby was born, all hell broke loose. Doug got a DNA test and found out that Billy was the daddy. He threw my stuff out of the house that day. Not surprisingly, my parents disowned me and I ended up moving in with Doug's parents. Doug wouldn't even talk to me for two weeks. He finally agreed to meet with me after his parents had been after him daily for almost a week. I know our talk was one-sided, but I had to get my husband to listen to me. He had to see how sorry I was and how much I needed him. I pleaded and begged, pouted and shouted screamed and cried. I would have stood on my head if I would have thought it would make Doug listen and understand. He really is my life, my love, my soulmate. I tried everything I could think of, but my husband just wasn't listening. I begged him to forgive me and told him that it was just a bad mistake. I explained it was just a mercy sex and didn't mean anything. I even told him the God's honest truth that it wasn't near as good as when we did it. Still, I got almost no response. All he would say to me was you slept with my brother and had his kid. Over the next week, his parents and I tried everything to get him to sit down and talk with us, to try to find a way to work through this. Billy even wrote him a letter trying to explain and apologize. I'm not blind. I could see how us constantly badgering him was affecting my husband. I could see the anger and frustration building in Doug. All someone has to do is watch his eyes. They're his tell. The more they squint, the closer he is to exploding. But I didn't have any other choice, he just wouldn't listen. I called him 15 times a day and went to his workplace a couple of times each day. Was I stalking Doug? I guess it could have seemed that way, but I've never backed away from a fight if it is about something important and there's nothing more important than my Doug. When he finally did talk to me, I almost wished he hadn't. He started with 304 foot and then got worse. By the time he finished, He'd called me every name in the book. He ended up pulling off my wedding ring while I sat there, petrified by his words. Up until then, I'd seen my husband's rage but was never threatened by it. Now I was its target, and it scared the shit out of me. About that time, Tom and Paula told me it's best to leave things be and stopped helping me. Doug had said some things to them that shook them up pretty bad. Like I said, his rage can be scary at times. I lost it when he moved to Alabama. For the first time, I considered my life without my duck. It was black and cold, and there was no hope or joy in it. The man I loved hated me. That night, I mixed a bottle of sleeping pills with a fifth of Jack Daniels. I woke up the next day in the hospital with a splitting headache and on suicide watch. They said I'd started calling people after Doug wouldn't take any more of my calls. They obviously found me in time and pumped my stomach. After that, Doug Jr., that's the baby's name. Want to live with Tom and Paula. I'm not allowed to be around it much. I'd like to say that bothers me, but it doesn't. The baby is a mistake, just a painful reminder that I don't have my husband. It took a little while, but I was able to track Doug down in Alabama after I got out of the hospital. I moved into the small trailer park where he was living. Needless to say, he wasn't thrilled to see me. 
I got a job at a local beauty parlor and settled into my routine. Work, call Doug. Work, visit Doug. Work, call Doug. Soon, I was visited by the Bama cops. I had to change my routine a bit when Doug filed a restraining order on me. But I didn't stop trying to talk to him. I couldn't, because if I had I would have lost him completely. It was about this time that Doug got his divorce. I guess the judge heard the baby was his brother's and figured we wouldn't be able to work it out. He just didn't know us very well. A couple of months after the divorce, Doug moved again. It took me eight months to find him. He'd moved to Texas. This time, when I moved to be near him, I didn't pressure him like I had in the past. I met some of the ladies whose husbands and boyfriends worked with him. I told them some of the highlights of our relationship, mainly focusing on my desire to get back together with him. I never lied to them. I just didn't tell them everything. I'd gotten another job in a salon so I could take it slower this time. If you're wondering about how I can get a job so quick, the answer is simple. I'm pretty, I work fairly cheap, and I do damn good work. It took a little while but Martha could see how much I loved him and how sorry I was I'd ruined it for us. I think she also saw how unhappy Doug was. So even though he said he wasn't interested in talking to me, we all knew it was just a matter of time before he would. That time finally came at his party. What Martha and I had planned backfired in the worst way possible. What started as a promising night quickly turned bad. Doug told everyone his version of our story. It was condensed and very harsh. I didn't dare interrupt him. I could see his eyes squinting. After he was done, I begged him to come home with me and he told me to go kill myself. I knew then, I'd lost him for good. After the party, I fell apart. Martha got me to a hospital and several days later I found myself here, in an Atlanta hospital under another suicide watch. You may be wondering about the baby. Well, I'm told it's doing great. I haven't been around it since right before my first breakdown. Tom and Paula are taking care of the baby right now. They'll probably end up adopting it because let's face it, I'm a shitty mother. What else would you call a woman who can't stand to look at her own child? I know that sounds horrible, but every time I see it, I remember my mistake and all it cost me. It's not the baby's fault, I know, but that doesn't change anything. Does that make me a terrible person? Hell yeah, in my eyes it does. I guess the doctors were right. This did help me discover who I am. Of course, who I found out I am makes me sick. I'm a horrible wife and mother who lost her only reason to live. I'll probably have to hide this little recording, or they'll never let me out of here. They say they want you to be honest, but when you are, it scares them. I've no doubt someday, I'll figure out a way to deal with this. I pray it soon. Meanwhile, Doug. I stood on the California beach, looking out over the Pacific. The nightmare I'd lived over the past few years was finally over. The ending had actually started several weeks after the party. I'd received a text from my cousin in Georgia that Teresa had killed herself. I was numb. It had been like waiting for the Titanic to finally sink, hoping against hope that somehow things would work out, but knowing they couldn't. I still loved her, but I couldn't have ever gone back to her. Then my path was clear. I wrote two short notes, enclosed them with the small black jewelry box, and sent it certified mail to my parents. The first note was addressed to my parents telling them that since Teresa had taken the easy way out it was up to me, his uncle, to look after my nephew's future. I said I knew they'd be able to take care of him financially after Billy and I were out of the picture. I ended it by wishing them better luck, raising my nephew than they had raising Billy and me. I'd addressed the little black box to my brother. Inside were four things. The smashed remains of Teresa and my wedding rings, a single 9mm bullet, and a note that just said, run. It took me a few weeks to catch up to him. I finally found him in a crack house in Atlanta. He was living there with some of his other junkie friends. I remembered his face when I put my Glock between his eyes. The stink of his room didn't compare to the reek when he shit himself. Please, he'd begged. Kill me, Doug. I can't live with the guilt. I'm so sorry. Some would call it weak. Others might call it strong, but I couldn't pull the trigger. I took a bullet out of my clip and tossed it to him. Do it yourself, you piece of shit. You're not gonna ruin any more of my life. Go shit on someone else's life. That was the last time I saw him, laying there crying in his own shit. I left Georgia that night knowing I'd burnt all my bridges there. I'd never go home again. That was a couple weeks ago. I got a text this morning saying that they'd found Billy's body. 
He died from an overdose. They found a 9mm bullet clutched in his hand. That chapter of my life was over. Looking out over that big ocean, I noticed there wasn't a boat or ship on it as far as the eye could see. I felt a loneliness that matched the emptiness in my heart. How do you live without your soulmate? I was about to find out. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.